There are many figures who contribute to history. Most are overlooked, some command the spotlight, and some are simply forgotten. American history is no exception with heroes, traitors, villains, and simply those who were in the right spot at the right time. But all these figures, good or bad, would contribute to this story. Our story. This is Forgotten Figures. Henry Knox was born in Boston in the colony of Massachusetts in 1750 to William and Mary Campbell Knox, immigrants from Ireland who, like many, were looking to start a new life in the new world. Young Henry would be the seventh of ten children the couple would have. He was enrolled in the Boston Latin School but had to drop out when his father died at the age of 50. This forced him to support his family from a young age by working as a clerk in a bookstore. Eventually, this would lead him to open up one himself. Henry Knox was an avid reader, and like today's youth, he gravitated towards something specific. His interest was military history and military science, and in particular, artillery. It's one of history's great what-ifs of, if he hadn't gotten into this interest, how the American Revolution would have turned out. As tensions in a colony increased from the Acts of Parliament and then the Boston Massacre, he decided to cast his lot with the revolutionaries and the Sons of Liberty, who would go on to lead the Boston Tea Party in 1773. He joined the Boston Grenadier Corps in 1772, and thanks in part to his knowledge on artillery, he was named second in command as a first lieutenant. Two years later, he would go on to marry Lucy Fluker, the daughter of a Loyalist family, and when the events of Lexington and Concord unfolded, the two fled Boston, and he offered his services to General Artemis Ward, who was conducting the Siege of Boston. Ward had been voted as the commander of all the militia forces by the militia forces themselves that had gathered around Boston. When Washington was appointed by the Continental Congress to assume command of all forces surrounding Boston and form a Continental Army, he commissioned Knox as a colonel for his knowledge and handling of artillery. Knox was given the unenviable task of gathering all the cannon from Fort Ticonderoga in Upper New York and transporting it to Boston. That is a journey of over 300 miles. There was no modern roads, no easy trails to follow, and especially not in winter. This was Knox's greatest contribution to the American Revolution, and certainly things would have turned out much differently had he not succeeded. Sitting on Lake George in Upper New York, Fort Ticonderoga had been captured shortly after Lexington and Concord by Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold. Henry Knox took stock of the inventory and began transporting almost 60 cannon and mortars using barges down the Hudson River, and then by horse and ox pulled sleds in what he dubbed the Noble Train of Artillery. They traveled over mountains and through deep drafts of snow, and even had to cross the Hudson River four different times. Several cannon had even fallen through the icy water before being pulled up. It took 56 days before the cannons began arriving in Cambridge. Here too is another overlooked contribution in the early days of the Revolution. Dorchester Heights resides to the south of the city and was the tallest point, taller than Bunker Hill, which is still the most notable landmark in Boston, and it sat unoccupied. Washington would use Knox's new artillery masterfully, and in the middle of the night on March 4, 1776, he would fortify Dorchester Heights. The British were so alarmed that they decided to evacuate Boston. This never would have been possible without Henry Knox. When Washington maneuvered the army to New York, Knox was tasked with establishing the defenses throughout Connecticut and Rhode Island. He rejoined the main army as it was retreating across New York. As Washington was contemplating his next move, Knox helped devise the idea of attacking the Hessians at Trenton. During the Christmas Day assault, he was instrumental in overseeing the initial crossing of the Delaware River, as well as ensuring every man made it back across afterward. The Continental Army would capture roughly a thousand men and much needed supplies, and for his role, Knox would be promoted to Brigadier General. He would stick by Washington's side through the battles of Brandywine in Germantown. When the war shifted south for the final act, Knox was a key component in forcing the British to surrender at Yorktown. He helped position the cannons in the best place to cause the most havoc while staying out of range as the siege lines moved closer. So here again, Knox would show a mastery of artillery to force the British to surrender. The first big win of the war was the British evacuating Boston, and the last big win was the one that secured our independence, and not enough credit goes to Henry Knox. All the great artillerists and artillery battles in our history owe some measure of respect to him. Knox would earn a promotion to Major General for his role in Yorktown, and in the final years of the war, Knox would be the commander at West Point. When the Treaty of Paris was ratified, he helped to oversee the British evacuation of New York. In 1785, the Congress appointed him as Secretary of War, and he continued in that capacity 
under Washington's presidency from 1789 until he resigned in 1795. As Secretary of War, he helped to establish a national militia and coastal fortifications. He wanted to establish military academies where, as he put it, the theory and practice of fortifications and gunnery can be taught. He would help to establish the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts, which would produce weaponry for over two centuries. He would also help to oversee a permanent navy starting in 1791. After his resignation, he would retire to his estate, Montpelier in Thomaston, Maine, where he would die in 1806. So that does it for my video of Forgotten Figures on Henry Knox. As always, thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, follow me on Twitter at Past and Present 4 and stay up to date on what my next video will be, as well as see some behind-the-scenes photos and some pictures of filming locations. Thanks again for watching.